This is a lecture on secondary growth and wood formation. We're going to cover a number of topics in several parts in this lecture, including some of the cell types in the vascular cambium and how they divide, the structure of tracheid and vessel element cell walls, different types of secondary growth and their categorizations, and then the physiological and environmental environmental and genetic control of wood characteristics in trees. Secondary growth, if you recall, is the result of the action of a secondary meristem. All plant growth occurs through meristems, and the secondary meristem is called a cambium. So cambium or secondary meristems produce growth in width, or diameter. There are a couple of kinds of secondary meristem. So the vascular cambium produces the vascular tissue, the phloem and xylem cells. The cork cambium produces the outer bark tissue. And we're really not going to talk much about cork cambium. So when we're talking about cambium here, this uh, secondary meristem, we're talking about the vascular cambium. And there's two types of cells in the cambium itself. There is There are fusiform initials and ray initials. The fusiform initials are cells that when they divide, form tracheids or vessel elements or fibers or phloem cells. So they can produce a number of different types of cells. The ray initials divide to form new ray parenchyma. Now both of those types, both fusiform initials and ray initials, can also divide to produce new copies of themselves, so to produce more vascular cambium. So just as a reminder, divisions of the vascular cambium to the inside produce xylem, divisions of the vascular cambium to the outside produce phloem. So this uh, is not a great diagram in that it doesn't show the fact that the vascular cambium also produces phloem to the outside. There's two kinds of cell divisions that occur in the vascular cambium. There's periclinal divisions, which are divisions along a plane parallel to the surface of the stem that produce uh, new xylem cells to the inside or new phloem cells to the outside. So those are periclinal divisions. Whereas anticlinal divisions are cell divisions that occur along a radial plane. And those divisions basically produce new vascular cambium cells, so new fusiform initials or new ray initials. Obviously, as the vascular cambium produces new cells, it has to get bigger because the size of that cylinder of xylem gets larger and larger. And that anticlinal cell division allows the vascular cambium to expand and basically become longer as that column of xylem becomes larger in the center. So let's talk in general about tracheid and vessel element structure. Now, as a reminder, tracheids and vessel elements are the primary water conducting cells in xylem. Vessel elements only occur in angiosperms whereas tracheids occur in both angiosperms and gymnosperms. Although <clears throat> tracheids don't do much water transport in angiosperms. So in general, these cells, um, when they're transporting water, are just a hollowed out cell wall. They don't have any um, cell membrane, or cytoplasm in them. So that structure 
that's left behind ends up being important both for water transport and for mechanical support, especially in gymnosperms where those tracheids provide both water transport and mechanical support functions. So those cell walls thicken from the outside in. So this is a diagram showing the initial primary cell layer that's laid down. And then as that cell develops and differentiates, it thickens from the outside in. So basically additional cell wall layers are laid down as that cell wall thickens. So the primary cell wall is the first layer that's laid down. It's the S or it's the primary cell wall layer. And then additional cell wall layers are laid down as the cell wall thickens as that cell develops. So the S1, S2, and S3 cell layers are added on sequentially towards the center as that cell wall develops. Those S layers, S1, S2, and S3 are basically the secondary cell walls. The S2 layer is the thickest layer. And it's important for properties of especially tracheids because that S2 layer is the thickest layer. So its, thick, its properties end up being the ones that determine cell and wood characteristics of wood made up of those tracheids, for instance. So this S2 layer is the thickest and its properties therefore determine wood properties in, that are derived from that region. So cell walls are made up of cellulose microfibrils. So cellulose microfibrils are basically bundles of cellulose molecules. So going down to the molecular level, cellulose is a polymer consisting of many glucose molecules strung together. So glucose, I'm sorry, cellulose is a polymer of glucose molecules that are covalently bonded together. And it's a polymer that may consist of hundreds to thousands of glucose molecules strung together. Those cellulose molecules then tend to coalesce together into microfibrils that are bonded, bonded to, to each other by hydrogen bonds. So this is a cellulose, part of a cellulose molecule. This is another cellulose molecule. And they tend to bond together with hydrogen bonds. And then those cellulose microfibrils which are bundles of cellulose molecules, are laid down to form the cell walls of tracheids or vessel elements. So you can sort of think of those cellulose microfibrils of, as ropes or bundles consisting of a number of cellulose molecules bound together. And it's sort of those microfibrils that are laid down to form the cell, cell walls. So if you look at this diagram, you can see these lines symbolize those cellulose microfibrils that are laid down to form the cell walls. Now the angle at which these microfibrils are laid down in the cell wall, as it turns out, is really important. So those cellulose um, microfibrils, their angle relative to vertical ends up being important for determining the structure of wood derived from those cells. So the microfibril angle refers to the angle of those microfibrils, mainly in the S2 layer, relative to vertical. So a small microfibril angle means that the microfibrils in the cell wall are laid down relatively close to vertical. And as those 
microfibrils, if they're laid down less vertical, so more horizontal, they have a larger microfibril angle. Interestingly, that angle ends up determining the stiffness of the wood derived from um, wood containing those um, tracheids. The smaller the microfibril angle of the cellulose microfibrils in those cell walls, the more stiff the wood. And the larger the microfibril ang angle, in other words, the less vertical the microfibrils are laid down, the less stiff the wood. So this is really interesting. This basically means that a, at the microscopic or molecular level, the angle at which those microfibrils are laid down in the cell wall determines how stiff, for instance, a two by four might be that's derived from that wood. And there's a reason for that. So let's envision a piece of wood that has nearly vertical cellulose microfibrils in its S2 layers of the tracheids in that wood. If we attempt to bend that two by four, that bending force that's acting on those nearly vertical microfibrils is acting on the very strong covalent bonds within the cellulose microfibrils. So that tends to make that wood relatively stiff. If, on the other hand, this two by four that we've cut out of the wood, if the S2 layer in those cell walls is more horizontal, when we attempt to bend that two by four, that bending force is acting more on the weaker hydrogen bonds that tie those cellulose molecules together to form the microfibrils. And that's weaker, so there'll be more bend or more give, and that wood will be less stiff. Now, my diagram is exaggerating the difference in angles relative to vertical, but it illustrates that the effect of that angle on the stiffness of wood, and that has a very real effect on the stiffness of wood derived from, for instance, a genotype that tends to have smaller microfibril angles versus a genotype that has a larger microfibril angle. And we'll talk about genetic variation in this trait later on in this lecture. But that microscopic property ends up having an important uh, effect on, in this case, wood stiffness. Lignin is another important part of cell, cell wall structure. So lignin is a highly complex organic molecule that's embedded in between all of the cellulose microfibrils, and it basically glues them all together in the cell wall. And it also glues together the different tracheids and other structures within the stem. That glue also helps to stiffen the cell wall and hold all of that together. So lignin is a, this is an example of a lignin molecular structure. And as you can see, lignin is, is a really complex molecule. It's also heterogeneous. That means not all lignin molecules look like this. This is just an example. So that complexity and size and the fact that there it's a polymer and there are a lot of cyclic compounds in lignin makes lignin very difficult to break down. So lignin uh, ends up being an important part or consideration when we're thinking about the pulping process. So when we pulp wood or basically prepare wood for making it into paper or other um, products that are derived from wood fibers, basically a big part of that step is breaking down and removing the lignin from the wood. So when you drive past 
a paper plant, for instance, you'll often smell that paper plant because those many of the wood pulping processes require very basic, meaning um, high pH chemical processes that often contain phosphorus compounds, basic phosphorus compounds under great heat and pressure to break down these lignans and basically wash them out of wood to separate then the tracheids and fibers in wood so that they can be used to make paper. And it's that process that's sometimes really smelly. And that requires a lot of energy. So a big part of the wood pulping process is breaking down lignin. And that's why we sometimes smell that sulfurous smell when we drive through, for instance, Palatka, Florida and smell that pulp mill. It's breaking down this lignin in the wood in the process of pulping. 